Please find a Bible and open up to 1 Kings chapter 3, please. 1 Kings chapter 3. If you need a Bible, uh, there are plenty of them in the room. There are the black books underneath the chairs. And if there's not one near you, again, just look around or wave frantically or act like, I can't find a Bible, and hopefully a kind soul will help you, or better yet, hand you their Bible already open to 1 Kings chapter 3. It's lovely to help. 1 Kings chapter 3. We're continuing on for a while in our series on good examples of bad examples. Good examples of bad examples. And uh, so we will begin reading in verse 1 of 1 Kings chapter 3. And uh, then we'll have some introduction and get into quite a little bit of scripture. But I think this evening it'll be a typical Sunday night where unfortunately the message is rather short. Charlie, how long did I preach this afternoon in Miami Beach? It felt like 15 minutes. I think I preached about 15 minutes in Miami Beach this afternoon. You know I'm feeling good when I'm preaching 15 minutes. <laughs> Some people, the worse they feel, the faster they get done. Me, the worse I feel, the slower. So it's been a great start to the new year. I was telling um, my good friend, you, many of you know Dan Marino, but uh, if you don't know him, he calls me and talks trash ever so occasionally. Not the Miami Dolphins guy that never won a Super Bowl, Dan Marino, but the other Dan Marino, who is my good friend, the real Dan Marino, who's won football at teen activity in the past. So anyway, <laughs> anyway, he calls and he likes to talk tough every now and again, but he always talks tough from a distance when he talks tough to me. So he called me the other day and he said, you know, I'm thinking about, he said he picks up cars not very far from my house at the Lipton Toyota dealership. He said, I'm over here and I'm about, he said, I'm thinking about coming over and giving you an attitude adjustment. I said, you know, I said, my back doesn't hurt. My calf doesn't hurt. My knees don't hurt. My ankles feel good. I'm about 40 pounds overweight, but I'd enjoy it. Why don't you come on over? And he said, well, I'll call you when I'm in Orlando. You know? <laughs> said, when I get to Orlando, I'll call you, and then I'll give you an attitude adjustment. <laughs> so, I'm feeling good this week, folks, I'm telling you. Uh, anyway, you have to know Dan Marino, and you have to know that I was very nice. The way that I said that to Dan Marino, I'm holding with my New Year's resolution of being nice. I offered him his choice. I said, I can throw you in a hedge, or I can throw you over the hood of a car, or I can throw you in a puddle. Whichever you choose. And so, you know, he, he said, well, I'll, I'll let you know when I get to Orlando. So, I just want you to know, I'm, uh, I need help. you got to remind me sometimes when you don't think things are nice, and I'll correct them. But for the most part, I've been holding uh, to my resolution and doing my very best. Are you in Are you in First Kings chapter 3? Did I stop looking long enough? Okay, here we are. And Solomon made an affinity with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David until he had made an end <coughs> excuse me, of building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall of Jerusalem round about. Only the people sacrificed in high places <coughs> excuse me, because there was no house built unto the name of the Lord until those days. And Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David his father, only he sacrificed and burnt incense in high places. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that <coughs> was a, the great high place. A thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer upon that altar. Let's pray. Father, please help us this evening to not only understand the Scripture, God help us to come to <coughs> an understanding of things that you want, God, the kind of people that you use, and the kind of God you are. But God, also in the places where we need it from the Scripture, help us to see good examples of bad examples. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you may think, well, Pastor Price is going to preach about high places this evening and how that Solomon should not have offered a sacrifice in one of the high places. But actually, that isn't so. That actually isn't what we're preaching about. And it would kind of fly into against the context that we're reading in if I were to do so. See, high places in the Bible have a good connotation and a bad one. Every high place had a history of something good, and it had become perverted or become bad, not because of what it represented originally, but what it came to represent. One of the ladies in the church this morning was talking about how that uh, 
she doesn't like pictures of Jesus, the images that people make of Jesus. And I, I wholeheartedly concur. It's not one of my life causes. I'm not going to come to people's homes if you've got a picture of Jesus and tear it down, that sort of thing. But I believe that it was on purpose that Jesus' picture was never painted, His image was never recorded. Uh, and the reason for that is because we are so prone to worship a representation of God instead of worshiping God Himself. Matter of fact, you remember one of the two kings who was the only ones to tear down the high places? One of the things he destroyed was the, <clears throat> the serpent of brass that Moses lifted up in the wilderness. And that's incredible to me because I think that would be a pretty cool memento, wouldn't it? The serpent in the wilderness, which was the picture of whom? Jesus Christ Himself. In other words, God knew what He was doing when He told Moses to lift up a serpent in the wilderness and that anybody that looked at it wouldn't die because it takes faith to believe God and look to a serpent on a, on a stick. We call it a snake on a stick is our uh, casual way of putting it. But sadly, that serpent of brass was broken up because people had started worshiping the snake on a stick instead of worshiping God. And so it isn't high places that are evil. It is the abusing of the high places. There are a lot of special places in the Bible. God met Moses in a burning bush. It was a special place. God met Jacob uh, in a special place. Uh, there are different places that are representative. And many of those places, ultimately, uh, that we are recorded in the Scripture, actually ended up being the place where the temple, where God dwelt among, Jerusalem, dwelt among Israel in Jerusalem, was actually constructed. And that's for another evening. My point this evening in the introduction is to simply say, simply state, that I'm not preaching against high places this evening. This is not where Solomon went wrong. Please look at verse 5 and you'll see what I'm saying. Verse 5, the Bible says, In Gibeon the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give thee. So Solomon offers a thousand sacrifices. That's something, isn't it? And God appeared to him that night in a dream and said, Ask me what, I'll, what I shall give thee. And we know of another instance of a king having that opportunity. Solomon took better advantage of his opportunity. And Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David my father great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness, that thou <coughs> hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child, I know not how to go out or come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad, for who is able to judge this thy so great people? In great humility of his heart, Solomon recognized his inability to perform the task that he was privileged to be called to. And Solomon did covet, not being king, he coveted the inheritance or the blessing of that promise, that covenant that God had with his father David. And it was the messianic promise that meant so much to Solomon. You have to study that to understand it. Solomon wasn't so thrilled, he wasn't bothered, but he wasn't so thrilled about being made king of a people that he called unable to be numbered because of the multitude. That wasn't what thrilled him so much. What thrilled him was the promise that God made and being part of that line, part of that promise. And you've got to love Solomon for that, don't you? And Solomon was very real about his ability, and you've got to love him for that as well. He said, I can't tell from my right hand or from my left hand. And forgive me, but I think perhaps he's not even being ironic. I think he's actually using an illustration. Sometimes I illustrate my ineptitude by things that I do. And I've met people that literally, you say right hand and they're like, you know, you tell them L and they can't figure out which way L's supposed to point. You know what I'm talking about? You ask somebody, Mrs. Price, how many kids have you taught that can't tell left or right? Not many. Ever taught any? She's going to ruin my illustration. Okay, thanks. All right. You ever met somebody? Oh, shit, yeah, my wife can't tell left from right sometimes. Okay, yep, was that nice? It wasn't mean, was it? Okay, she's happy. She's fine with it. So I wasn't mean to, to my wife. I'm not mean to my wife. Ask her. Okay. Anyway, now she won't get me later. She doesn't care. Anyway, 
Uh, I think Solomon literally was saying, God, it's great that I get to be king of Israel. That's neat. I want to be king of Israel. It's a great privilege. But God, the is Israel has a king that can't tell left or right. <laughs> that's how intelligent I am. I really think that's where Solomon's at. I'm not saying the guy was an imbecile, but it takes an intelligent person actually to know what they can't do. Matter of fact, that's probably the most intelligent kind of person. You show me a person who has seen great success in life and they've learned how to be very, very honest about their inability, more so than their ability. They know what their ability is, but better than that, they know what they cannot do. And they're able to get those things done by other people. And that was simply Solomon. And so he asked for something. He said, I can't judge right or left, and yet I'm responsible for judging an innumerable multitude of people. I'm their judge. That's what a king really had to ultimately do, was to be the ultimate judge of the people. And so he said, God, give me an understanding heart so that I can judge the people well. Now you got to like Solomon at this point, don't you? How would you like to have a ruler that said, I want God to give me understanding so I can be a good judge? In other words, God help me do a good job. That takes some notable humility. That, that takes someone who, you know, <coughs> was ever a wiser man than King Solomon? Was ever a richer man than King Solomon? Was there ever anything good in comparison with King Solomon where it would, be, would it exceed King Solomon? No, he's the benchmark after asking this. And so he asked for an understanding heart to judge the people well. And I'm impressed with Solomon at this standpoint. Now here's where we stop and we begin to share with you a caveat. One of the things that I want us to understand as we look in our series of good examples of bad examples is that not everything's bad. Not everything's bad about a person that we use for a bad example. But one of our points, one of our underlying themes that we want to glean in our series is that God's word mentioning or recording that something happened a certain way is not God's endorsement of it. <clears throat> in other words, the Bible reports things that are against God's will. Just because someone in, quote, I love the phrase because it's comical, quote, in the Bible, I don't know if you conjure up in your imagination like people in, you know, living inside a Bible when you say people in the Bible, but we use the phrase, but just because someone that quote is in the Bible or mentioned in the Bible did something does not mean God's okay with it. And there are a lot of terrible doctrinal teachings that actually come from people saying, well, it happened in the Bible as though that's God's rubber stamp. I approve. And it isn't so. God actually disapproves. The second thing I want to emphasize, and perhaps we have not emphasized this enough, is that even a bad example God can use for good. And not everything in Solomon's life is bad. Even a bad example God can use for good. Last time we were in this series, we were talking about Balaam. I think one of the all-time best good examples of a bad example. And Balaam had a will, he had a hard attitude that said, if I can get away with it, I'll curse God's people. And God <laughs> used him to bless God's people. So even a bad example can be used by God for good. There's another underlying theme that's related or connected with that, or maybe it's just a commentary on that, and that is that not only can a bad example be used for good, but just because somebody is once good doesn't mean that they always will be. Sometime for your personal benefit, study apostasy in the New Testament of the Scripture. I've always been impressed that the warnings about false teachers are normally given to people who are sound teachers. And the warnings are, don't you be a false teacher. It's interesting that somebody who's solid can turn from the truth. And there ought to be some fear in us. Because when I look at the example of a King Solomon, I think, my goodness. I mean, if that guy can't make it with what he had, then how can I? Well, there's a simple answer to that. God gave me His Word and God gave me good examples of bad examples and told me what to do with it. 
And so can I do right? I certainly can. Will I always do right? With God's help. But I could certainly do wrong, couldn't I? So God can use us anyway. So I hope you understand those things. Now, we'll move on. We'll try to work our way <clears throat> through uh, the portion of the Scripture that I want to read right now. So, in verse 10, the Bible says God's response to what Solomon said was, And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And God said unto him, Because thou hast not asked this thing, and asked, <coughs> or sorry, because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. By the way, did, did Solomon ask for wisdom? Kind of, kind of. Specifically, he asked to be a wise judge, to, to discern judgment. You say, Pastor, that is wisdom. Yeah, God knows what the word wisdom is, and he could have used it more specifically if he'd like to. So I just want to point that out. It's not important. It's not a major point. Uh, discerning judgment would include wisdom, but Solomon wanted to be a good king. That's what he's asking for. Okay? And uh, he said, Lo, in verse 12, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. Whoa. So God said, I've given you a wise and an understanding heart. <coughs> That sets you apart from anybody who ever was or ever will be. Verse 13. Anybody ever want to pray to have a double portion of King Solomon? <laughs> Too bad you don't get to. Verse 13. And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. And he goes on to talk about his promise. In verse 14. <coughs> if thou wilt walk in my ways and keep my statutes and my commandments, as thy father did walk, then I will lengthen thy days. And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. He came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord and offered up burnt offerings and offered peace offerings and made a feast to all his servants. And then we begin to see examples of how God actually did in Solomon what he had promised him in the dream. Now, will you please go to chapter 11? We've seen the good aspect of Solomon's life, and actually... It's pretty well summarized by the way he began. Whereas you could just summarize Solomon by saying he started out really well and he really did some great things. In verse 11 of 1 Kings, I mean, sorry, verse 1 of 1 Kings 11. But King Solomon loved many strange women. <coughs> Together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. Now it's really interesting. Uh, that in verse 1 of chapter 3, the Bible says, And Solomon made affinity with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and took Pharaoh's daughter. In verse 1 of chapter 11, we see, But King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites. If you were to read down further, you would see in verse 3, uh, well, verse 2, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, You shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. Let me stop for just a second and ask you a question just for trivia. It's not exactly even related to the message this evening, except that it's a good contrast. Who was the king of Israel who had only one wife? Jehoshaphat. Was it Jehoshaphat? Saul. Saul. Saul had one wife. Huh? There's nothing in the scripture to indicate that he had any other wife. We know that he had a wife, and he had, what, eight children? And uh, that's possible. You know, that's uh, pretty, pretty well doable. And... Uh, this is, this is extra, but you know, Saul had pretty good kids too. It's interesting. There's not a better man mentioned in the scripture than Jonathan. There's not a better man mentioned in the scripture than Jonathan. He was a godly, good example of what a man ought to be. Just a good man, Jonathan was. Saul actually raised a pretty good family. And he was nuts. 
<laughs> so <laughs> you go ahead and draw the conclusions uh, that you'd like to, unless you're nuts, then don't do it. Is it? Yeah, but nobody here is nuts. Okay, let me finish it by being nice. Okay, so, all right. <laughs> Let's, that's just extra. That's not part of the message this evening. I, I, I think I'm going to add, or I'm thinking of adding a resolution that extras don't get into my messages. That would be good, wouldn't it? <laughs> Deuteronomy. Will you go to Deuteronomy chapter 17? Deuteronomy 17. Here's the tragedy. Not in this church because it's been addressed before, but in general in the church, that is, born-again believers. If you were to make this statement and say, answer me true or false, the statement being, God allowed polygamy in the Old Testament. And the Old Testament law actually taught the children of Israel how to do it. True or false? The average Christian says true. The Bible doesn't teach that. But scarcely a believer doesn't hold to that. Sadly enough. I almost introduced another topic to illustrate it, but I think I'm not going to because your minds are going to race away and I'll lose you. So uh, I was going to use something and I, I won't. Let's, let's stick on topic and we'll just make a simple point this evening. Let me just make a simple statement. God defined marriage as a family unit of two people who become one. That's the family. That's what God defined a family as. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife. The word cleave is like the word glue. And they two shall become one flesh. So it's two become one and that's God's definition of marriage. In addition to that, uh, mar the picture. In the New Testament of the Scripture, marriage is a picture of Christ and His undying, unfailing love for His church. And we, as the bride of Christ, are seen as marred or tarnished, but in the process of being sanctified, so that he can present us a glorious church to himself without spot or wrinkle. And we're told even further about Christ's church that ultimately we will be conformed to his own image. That is, every person whom God has ever saved is predestinated ultimately to be just like Jesus in purity. And so I remind people all the time when they complain about their spouses, particularly men, that it is the task of every man to, pre, to grow his wife so that she will be perfect. In other words, I'm telling you, husbands, you want a task, a defined task of marriage. It is literally to nurture and to grow your wife to the place that she's without spot or wrinkle. It's like perfect, and that's the picture of what Jesus is doing with us. And so I also get frustrated with people that bash the church. I don't like that very much. And the reason I don't like it very much is because I think God hates it. Uh, when people disparage the church and they talk badly about Christ's church, I'm always reminded that God nowhere describes the church as glorious and perfect. He describes her as imperfect, but in the process of sanctification. And so a church with problems is exactly the way Jesus described further, when you read the letters to the church, with the exception of the letters to Thessalonica, every one of the letters to the church are full of corrections, putting it kindly, to churches that had, had major problems without ever a command to get out of there, leave that mess, and uh, stop going, or get out of there, leave that mess, and, you know, start, no, it's like, fix it. When you see a problem in the church, Christ loves her, He's fixing her, and you're supposed to be part of the process of sanctification in the church. I hope that's a help to you. I hope it's a help to you as a believer. That's our role in the church, and, and uh, it's a good example. Okay, so now, and it's a good example of a good example, by the way. <laughs> okay, so now, here we are back in chapter 17 of Deuteronomy, and we're going to see a command to a king and then we'll just draw conclusions and make judgments about King Solomon. Verse 14. 
When thou art come unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shalt possess it, and shalt dwell therein, and shalt say, isn't this incidental or ironic, I will set a king over me like as the nations that are about me. So when you come into the land, when you possess it, and when you say, we want a king like the other nations have. <laughs> Did that happen? Mm -hmm. Yes. Here's another example of God's saying, when this happens, this is what you do. But God's saying you're not supposed to do it. It's ironic to me how many people use the example that this happened, therefore God approves. In other words, they say it happened, so God approves. God is not here in approving of something which He has expressly forbidden in the Scripture. He's told Israel, I'm your king. I'm your king. When Samuel was told by the Israelites, we want a king, and Samuel was angry with Israel, God said, they haven't rejected you, they've rejected me. God did not want Israel to have a king like the other nations, but He knew they would. He knew what they'd do. So He said, when you do that, when, this, when you do this, then He said in verse 15, Now shall in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. He said, so when you decide to get a king, you have to let me pick him. <laughs> well, that's pretty good, isn't it? That takes a little, eases the pain a little bit. Let me stop there and just say something else. Isn't it amazing how merciful God is? If I were writing this for God, I'd be like, God, now here's the line I'd put in the next sentence. When you do this, I'm going to have the earth open up. <laughs> and you're going to drop into the fiery pit. From where I'm going. You know, that's how I'd write it. But, but God said, when you do it, I want to choose Him. I want to use Him. And that's a merciful God. That's amazing. In verse 15, the second part, <coughs> here are some qualifications. One from among thy brethren, shalt thou set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. And then in verse 16, but he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to the end, that he should multiply horses. <coughs> For as much as the Lord has said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. Verse 17 will come to our conclusion. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his heart turn not away. Neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. 17, 17, the first part. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his heart turn not away. In other portions of the Scripture, we're told that the children of Israel are not to marry wives from other nations because they'll turn their heart away. In other portions, or in this particular portion of the Scripture, we're told that a king is not to marry multiple wives from other nations because they'll turn his heart away. God expressly forbade Solomon's doing what he did. Matter of fact, if you were to read further in chapter 17, you'd also see that every king is supposed to write out the law and keep his own personal copy so that he'll know how to please God. So any king that would say, I didn't know, you know, obviously chapter and verse wouldn't have been there. I didn't know that was there. I didn't know that was written. You wrote it yourself. You copied it out. Handwritten. And if anything ought to impress a king when he's writing his own copy of the law, when he's being his own scribe, if anything ought to impress a king, it ought to be something that's talking about kings. So Solomon doesn't have an excuse, first, for marrying Pharaoh's daughter. He doesn't have an excuse, first, for marrying Pharaoh's daughter. And he doesn't have an excuse, secondarily, for marrying all of the extra wives and having relationships with women that God forbids. And so let's go to Solomon, to that portion of the Scripture where we see uh, that actually being carried out. Verse 1 of chapter 11 of 1 Kings. While you're turning there, I'll begin reading. But King Solomon loved many strange women together with the daughter of Pharaoh. <coughs> 
women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, You shall not go into them, neither shall they come into you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. Verse 4, For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God as with the heart of David his father. In other series, we could preach about David being a good example of a bad example. Couldn't we? There are some failings in David's life. Some things that God was against in David's life. But David's life ended with his heart being perfect before God. And so he's really a pretty good overall example because he ended well. Solomon began as well as his father had with regard to the love he had for the Lord. Unfortunately, Solomon allowed his heart to love more than just God. You say, Pastor, if I marry a wife, am I supposed to love her? Yes. You're supposed to love God and you're supposed to love your wife out of the response to your love for God. So yes. Ladies, a husband who loves you because of he loves God will love you better than a guy who loves you instead of God or in addition to God. And that's a fact. A man who loves a woman because he loves God and vice versa will be more pure, more dedicated and devoted in that love because of their love for God. That's a fact. And Solomon loved in addition to God. Or loved not because of God. God didn't make Solomon marry the daughter of Pharaoh. After he married her, he still loved God. Ultimately, she and the other wives turned his heart away from loving God. He didn't love God the way that he did when he began. And my friend... Solomon isn't alone in that propensity. You and I have a tendency to wander or to stray in our devotion and in our love for God. And the place of access where we will stray will be the place of disobedience. I'm not doing this because I don't love God. I'm doing this because the place where we begin to stray will be the place where we disobey. And Solomon's a good example of disobedience and the subsequent or consequent result that he didn't love God the same way that he did before he loved strange women. And so he's a good example in several ways of a bad example. Father, thank you for what we learned this evening and I pray that you would help us to learn from the Scripture, from the good example of a bad example, so that we would not follow King Solomon. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for your good attention. You're dismissed. <coughs>